M S W Media. I'm Greg Oliar. Four years ago, I stopped writing novels to report on the crimes of Donald Trump and his associates. In 2018, I wrote a best-selling book about it, Dirty Rubles. In 2019, I launched Prevail, a bi-weekly column about Trump and Putin, spies and mobsters, and so many traitors! Trump may be gone, but the damage he wrought will take years to fully understand. Join me and a revolving crew of contributors and guests as we try to make sense of it all. This is Prevail. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hello and welcome to Clean Up on Aisle 45. It is episode 59 and it is Wednesday, March 2nd. <laughs> Hi there, Allison. Great to see you. Uh, and uh, it just, you know, we, we were talking about this right right before the record as, as our listeners uh, no doubt know. We record the show a couple days in advance. So, you know, for the foreseeable future with the world being on fire, we are going to be way behind on current events, especially uh, everything that's going on in Ukraine. Um, you can follow us on our respective social media accounts. Know that we stand with Ukraine. Our heart goes out to everybody who has been uh, touched uh, and affected as a result of just the naked aggression by Russia there. I think uh, on any given day, there, there are reasons to be optimistic. There are reasons to be pessimistic. Um, show's probably not the right, the right format for that, but, uh, but our hearts do go out to you. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, and on a cheerier note, I want to thank our new patrons, Terry Oliver and Suzanne Dewey. And if you'd like to join their ranks and get a nice shout out on here, plus the ad free feed, plus our other goodies, our zoom meetings and, <laughs> things like that. For as little as a buck an episode, you can do that by heading over to patreon.com slash IL45pod, A-I-S-L-E 45-P-O-D, and sign up to help support the show. Your support helps keep us off Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> it does indeed. And Allison, it's also that time again in which we uh, thank every once a month, we thank our Hall of Famers, our all-time greats. So big shout out to Actual malice is a high bar, but Fox News is playing limbo. <laughs> January 20th, baby. Crime or no criming. Lance Buckley. Metacon 7. Mitzelplick. Operation Brownie Pockets dot com is a free game you play in real life. When the moon hits your eye, how come you don't die? The moon is fucking huge. <laughs> That Simpsons episode with the <laughs> and it turned out to infringe one of his uh, earlier copyrights. Anyway, uh, and just as proof that I don't always give you the hard names, special thank you to Wood Duck, Wood Duck, a wooden duck, but would Wood Duck, Duck, a duck duck, ducked by Duck Duck Goose mm. at Atomic Penguin 7 on Twitter. That one's just for you, Atomic Penguin. Yes, leave it to, <laughs> yeah, leave it to Atomic Penguin 7 but for, for that wonderful name. And a special shout out to Christopher Dalpy, David in Brooklyn. Hello, David. Dude, Charles Jones, Chris Waltrip. Jamil uh, Chohan, excuse me, Jessica Oatbeer, Patty B, Mitchell, and our all-time great, Chris Simpson. Chris Simpson, woo! <laughs> all right, and now with that out of the way, on with the show. Yes, and in our lead story today, as predicted, President Biden confirms that his nominee to the Supreme Court will be Katanji Brown-Jackson of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Now, this comes as no surprise to either you nor I, Andrew, She's been a rising star for years. Literally one of the very first things Joe Biden did as president was to elevate her from the district court uh, of the District of Columbia, where she'd been serving for almost a decade 
to the D.C. Circuit, which has long been the training ground for the Supreme Court. Yeah, that's right. So not only is this a historic pick, it's an incredibly inspiring one as well. There is absolutely no argument to be made against her. Her qualifications are essentially identical to Neil Gorsuch's, uh, except that she served on a slightly better circuit court, right? So that means that in any sane uh, pre-Mitch McConnell, pre-Donald Trump universe, she would be confirmed 98 or 99 to 0, uh, because even in a sane universe, Marco Rubio is still the laziest joke of a senator ever who can't be bothered to show up and do his goddamn job. <laughs> yeah, but in our universe, yeah. uh, she was last confirmed in June by a vote of 53 to 44. That's every Democrat in favor. Yes, I'm counting Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin as Democrats. Mm -hmm. Plus Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, Frau Burrowing, and somewhat surprisingly, <laughs> uh, Lindsey Graham, Princess, Princess Lindsey. Three more Republicans yep. were no-shows. Uh, ben Sass of Nebraska, Roy Blunt of Missouri, and of course, Marco, Marco Rubio. Rubio. <laughs> you know, I am actually really curious why Mitt Romney opposed her the last time, right? Like when you see got three Republican votes, you know, Romney is sort of the next place you go. Um, I guess we'll get a chance to find out again this, this go-round. Um, look, we know Joe Biden values attempts at bipartisanship. Um, I'm not sure I care all that much, uh, but uh, I think the way that I would define that in the context of this nomination is getting a Republican vote. So, uh, A.G., uh, some beans here. Do you think Judge Brown Jackson will get a Republican vote for SCOTUS? Uh, double or nothing. Do you think she'll change a no vote or pick up one of the not present or otherwise get more than 53 votes this time around? So, Ooh. So both of those I throw to you. I think she'll get 52 votes with Murkowski and Collins. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think Lindsey Graham is going to... He he already set this up so he wouldn't have to vote yes by by wanting J. Michelle Childs and that not being the nominee. Um, so he doesn't... So he has a reason. I think he just did this to have a reason to vote no. Um, so that's what I think. I think it'll be 52. I... I think I agree with that. Um, I, I guess I would add this sort of scenario. Um, I think that McConnell will whip all 50 votes in opposition, right? And say, look, if something happens to any of the Democrats, right? If something happens to a Democratic senator between now and when the final confirmation vote is, I want us to be there to steal the seat if we can. Uh, but if it turns out it's going to be 50-50, okay, Murkowski Collins, I'm I I release you, I absolve you to vote in favor of of Judge Brown Jackson. And look, like we're easy to make fun of when it's the most evil person in the universe uh, doing it. it. It Chuck Schumer did the same thing, right, with respect to uh, first getting and then releasing uh, Joe Manchin on um, on Neil Gorsuch, for example. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, 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 I think that dynamic is going to play out behind the scenes, uh, and I think that he will hold those votes in reserve if if something happens, which again is another reason to get out there in twenty twenty two and pad our Democratic majority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Um, so and and uh, I mean, I think we should talk a little bit. Like I mentioned, has essentially the same resume. Uh, as uh, as Neil Gorsuch, uh, by that I mean top of her class at Harvard, Harvard Law School, Law Review, top of her class, Harvard Law Review, mm -hmm. three different federal clerkships, including one to the Supreme Court clerking for Justice Breyer, whom she's uh, now going to uh, replace, uh, just an unimpeachable record. So, you know, it's hilarious seeing uh, the uh, the. Uncle Frank's of the world <laughs> try and uh, impugn her intelligence. How about the Jonathan Turleys of the world who who was like, well, I just uh, most of her record is is unknown. No, it isn't. It's all literally on the record, and she has more experience than I think it was Breyer and Kavanaugh, like and Roberts combined. Right. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan uh, Turley's an asshat. Yeah, but. he's he's an idiot. Jonathan <laughs> it, Turley. She has five hundred and forty two published opinions during her decade <laughs> on the US uh, district court for the District of Columbia. And 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 no, like if I'm trying to be charitable to someone who is an attention garnering dipshit, right? Um, here is the charitable argument. Because she's not a frothing, vapid ideologue, 
you can't easily pin her down in a box and say, oh, her judicial philosophy is obviously I'm going to pick whatever, you know, is the most liberal side and just vote for that. Um, so, you know, if you'll if you'll forgive the plug, uh, we just dropped a 70 minute a deep dive episode of OA in which we take her self-identified top 10 most significant opinions, right? This is what she told the Senate Judiciary Committee. These are the most important cases that I've ruled on. Uh, and we go through them one by one and we show, for example, um, that, uh, you know, of those opinions, there are two uh, in which she upheld Trump era regulations that yet, you know, she would like to have not done so. Right. Like one of them was, you know, waiving environmental restrictions uh, to construct Trump's stupid border wall. Right. And but the problem is, is that the statute gave uh, the the secretary of, of Homeland Security the authority to to waive those regulations. Mm. And she looked at it and said. Law is super clear. Uh, I, you know, I have to do what I have to do here. And um, <laughs> yeah. I guess I guess that seems confusing for somebody like Jonathan Turley, who's like, wait, it, it, it doesn't say I just reflexively reach the conservative <laughs> outcome here. How is this jurisprudence? And the answer is this is the hard work that real lawyers do. Right. Mm. That we've we lost sight of that because we spent four years elevating Justin's and Corey's to the bench who were literally just picked Trevor's. by the fucking Federalist Society. Yeah. To uh, to 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 rule in favor of predetermined outcomes. This is what the hard work of being a lawyer is is about. Right. Is taking the language of the statute, applying historical precedent, past case law to understand how that language in context. Uh, and then applying those principles to hard cases. Um, this used to be what all Supreme Court justices did. And the fact that it seems quaint or weird is an illustration of how far the process has been perverted and not uh, not anything against Judge Brown Jackson, who, you know, like you said, is a uh, is a rock star. Mm, yeah, uh, definitely. Absolutely unimpeachable and, and just I I love her. I love listening to her. I hope I hope when she's on the bench she she talks a lot because uh, usually they get quiet. <laughs> but, but I really like listening to her. She's just so smart. I, I I share that and and I I added this little moment uh just really briefly on the uh on the OA episode. Um I was reading one of her opinions and you know, about Lawyer after my own heart, she routinely writes these like hundred page opinions. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. And this had, you know, five sections and each section had multiple sub points. And so when you were at subsection 4D, right, with, with five was the conclusion. So you get to 4D. This is page 67 of the opinion. And it begins with you know, r r relax, the end is nigh, right? <laughs> like, and it was just this kind of great little warm moment of like, I, I know I've written a long fucking opinion, but don't worry, it's almost over, right? <laughs> and 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 judges with that, with that level, that, that, that just skirting the line of self-deprecating humor, really, really rare, you know? Like it, it, it Antonin Scalia and Neil Gorsuch are just mean. Right. Yeah. Like they write bitterly. Well, Scalia wrote, but bitterly sarcastic, nasty, horrible opinions. And, uh, you know, as we've pointed out, sometimes that sarcasm comes and bites you in the ass because a court will read it literally and go, oh, well, you know, <laughs> you said. And the, and the strongest example of that is the Fourth Circuit in, in Colby versus Hogan, which took Scalia's language uh, from the D.C. versus Heller opinion, which was like, well, obviously, you know, no legislature would seek to, you know, allow people to possess military weapons. Right. Which he meant as a throwaway line. And then they used it. And they were like, Whoop, see, Scalia says if it's a military weapon not covered by the Second Amendment. And now all of these acolytes are sort of left being like, oh, man, why? Why couldn't he have just not been an asshole? And the answer is, you, know, <laughs> he can't you wouldn't love him asshole. as much as you did. Right. Yeah. That, that was integral to his personality. <laughs> um, so I liked I liked that skirting line. I should point out again, uh, uh, other side. Right. As, as we mentioned, uh, Brett Kavanaugh has spent a lifetime developing like the most bland writing style imaginable. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I like to imagine him as the, uh, the beige, uh, you know, the neutrals from Futurama, but, uh, you know, yeah. I was on the subcommittee that 
altered the color of the that the, that the regulations appeared in. We kept it gray. You know? mm-hmm. um, all right, now but, I have a uh, game for all of us during the Senate confirmation ooh. hearings. I'm calling it Aces Kennedy Bigotry Sexism Countdown. All right. And so basically, is once John Kennedy has the floor, how many seconds into his first question will he mispronounce her name on purpose? Oof. That's that's the game. <sighs> Well, I'm glad closest. you're making a game out of it because, yeah, uh, uh, Price is Right rules. Closest Clo- yeah, without closest going without going over. And, of course, it's not a game and it's no laughing matter. But uh, the yeah. point here being that there is going to be there's going to be some assholery that's going yeah. to enrage us. I just want everybody to There be already has been. When when your fucking youth pastor who wears his hat backwards and sits on the chair to rap with the kids describes Ketanji Brown Jackson as being, you know, not that bright for a Supreme Court justice. That is code for she's black, oh, right? Yeah. Like she's mm-hmm. way smarter than that dipshit. She's way smarter than me. She's way smarter than everybody having that conversation about her intelligence. And, you know, this is not the guy. There, there were zero people on the left who looked around and said, you know, who's kind of a dim bulb, Neil Gorsuch, right? Like, no, we didn't say that. We said he's committed to a judicial ideology that's undermining the United States of America. But we did not say uh, because it would have been preposterous. Isn't that smart? Anybody who's saying that is uh, is a racist. You can safely write them off. Uh, agreed. All right, everybody, we're going to be right back. We've got more show, but we have to take a quick break. So stay with us. Hello, I'm Jeff Stein. And I'm Jean Meserve. Together, we host the Spy Talk podcast. Every week, we delve into the worlds of intelligence, foreign policy, military operations, and the intersection of all three in national security issues. Spycraft, cybersecurity, violent extremism, whether at home or abroad, technology's impact on intelligence gathering. We cover it all and much more. We interview former spooks, military officers, government officials, journalists, and national security researchers. Leveraging our backgrounds in military intelligence and homeland security, along with our decades of experience as journalists and news organizations like Newsweek, The Washington Post, and CNN. So join us every Thursday for a new episode of Spy Talk, available wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back. I have to tell you, Allison, sometimes doing the show is uh, tearful. Sometimes it's a challenge when we have to break uh, really bad news. And sometimes you get a show like today that begins with us cheerleading for the first African-American woman Supreme Court justice and then segues into all the hilarity. (laughs) Oh, wait, let me guess. Uh, If it's hilarious, if it's hilarious and it has to do with the law, it's got to do with uh, Sidney Powell. Uh, uh, you've been reading the supplemental filings in King v. Whitmer, the Michigan sanctions case, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, last week, we broke down the Kraken lawyers' laughable efforts to get the Fifth Circuit to issue an injunction and stay those sanctions. Sidney Powell did what she does best and lost the case, <laughs> lost that case as well. So now I've noticed there are a flurry of filings. Tell us. <laughs> Tell us about the hilarity. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the emergency application for a TRO that the Krakens lost before the Sixth Circuit means that although they're still appealing the merits of the sanctions issued by Judge Linda Parker, you know, the ones we broke down at great length in our live show. Yeah, while uh, we were staying at the Hay Adams uh, with Volodymyr Zelensky was there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Historical moment. Um, So they can still argue that these sanctions are are bad and they don't have to comply with them, including the monetary sanctions. Um, But they do have to comply with them uh, unless and until a higher court reverses. Spoiler alert, that will not happen. Mm. Right. And so that meant that by last Friday, February 25th, Each and every one of these low-grade morons was required to complete six hours of continuing legal education in pleading standards. And I cannot tell you how much of an insult that is to somebody who's been practicing law for two decades. We're gonna we're gonna go through it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try. But uh, and also another six hours of CLE for election law. This is uh, the way Thomas put it was like uh, you know, do you ever get a traffic ticket when you're in your you know like late twenties, early thirties, and the judge is like, why don't you attend the like safe driving school, comedy and, you know? traffic <laughs> school? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, uh, and. And this is the important part. It had to be a nonpartisan course 
and each lawyer had to file an affidavit with the court identifying the classes they took, the length, and describing the content, and I have gotten to parse all of them. <sighs> so these filings are affidavits, which they're really good at, by the way, the Kraken yeah. team. Very good at <laughs> affidavits. Uh, from various Kraken lawyers, attesting to the classes they took. And uh, spoiler alert, it will not surprise you that some of the lawyers who are about to get fucking disbarred and have staked their entire careers on shitting on the law and abusing the courts and lying about the 2020 election also decided not to comply with the judge's order. Yeah, no, that 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 came as no surprise. What what actually surprised me were the ones who did comply. And the 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 best a model citizen here was L. Lynn Wood. Hmm. Go figure. Huh. Uh, he he took I and I, I have to, to show some of this. So uh, of his uh, six hours of, of uh, continuing legal education for pleading standards, he took uh, a, a, a class called pleading standard standards post Iqbal. That's super relevant, right? Iqbal was an early 2000s Supreme Court standard that a Supreme Court case that changed what you must plead in your complaint to survive a motion to dismiss. So mm. it's it's a it's a crucial case. I mean, anybody who practices law already knows Iqbal and Twombly, but whatever. That's that's right. I, I do like he took an hour long class of formatting briefs and pleadings in MS Word. Um, <laughs> given, that's an MS Word problem, course. Yeah. yeah give, but look, given the problems that Kraken lawyers have had, you know, uh, making sure that their briefs comply with page limits are mm. formatted properly font that they, they, they had one bounced from the Sixth Circuit for putting it in the wrong font. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, huh. It's probably a good Did idea. They do it in Comic Every... Sans because that's <laughs> yeah. what it should. All their from now on, all their filings need to be in Comic Sans. It, I would be in favor of amending the local rules that says <laughs> if you were Sippy Powell or, or or Howard Kleinhandler, you must file everything in Comic Sans <laughs> from here on out. Um, and, and and no, but so you know, unimpeachable in terms of uh, the the. Uh, classes that he took his voting rights classes he took voting by mail early voting and digitized election administration COVID-19 and voting rights ensuring full and equal participation international political influence and corruption in elections will recent events lead to stricter U.S. regulation these were nonpartisan, perfectly valid CLE courses the only thing that looked a tiny little bit fishy to me was a class called hacking elections Cyber threats, vulnerabilities, and the way forward. Um, I, but you know, the, the other Kraken lawyers, plenty of them took that class with him. Uh, I, 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 that in and of itself doesn't raise any flags. Um, this, is, of course, is the best compliance. Uh -huh. <laughs> I went through all the rest of the affidavits. Uh, somebody else who who did a pretty good job was uh, Emily. It's my first day, Newman. Right? Uh, she Newman. Took <laughs> she took affirmative defenses under Iqbal and Twombly, right? A similar class. She took a class called the fundamentals of pleading practice in state and federal court that almost everybody else did. And I like to envision that being like the scene from fast times at Ridgemont high at the like begin and like, you know, Emily and, and her like fellow malcontents are like sitting in the back of the classroom, ordering the pizza that, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, it, so, you know, um, uh, she took law lines, election protection for attorneys, how to help voters, right? Like that. These are uh, that was in 2020, but that's a, that's an evergreen class. So yeah. you, you know, it's um, uh, this is this is good faith efforts to comply. Um, I may be setting something up here. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Br Brad Johnson. I do not know. Uh, Brad Johnson, you know, ex backup quarterback for the Washington football team, right? Like I couldn't pick that guy out of a lineup, right? Uh, 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 he's an overachiever. He took an extra hour of election Whoa. classes. Uh, and what I loved was his six hours of pleading standards classes includes, and I'm not making this up, three courses offered by Newbie Litigator School. And I'm not kidding. In all caps, it is called Newbie Litigator School, which is the equivalent of walking out of the Barnes and Noble with the like, you know, uh, the complete idiot's guide pleading to how dummies. to practice law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but hey, hey, he at least had to take those classes. Um, then, uh, you know, we cause skirting the line, we had uh, Julia Z. Haller. That was the... Uh, attorney who spent most of the hearing uh, on the edge of tears, you might recall her, um, who uh, was fell for, like, I think Judge Parker 
sprung the trap on her like seven times in a row, right? Was like, uh, Ms. Hallard, did you review this affidavit? And she would either say like, yes, I did review the affidavit. And then Judge Parker would be like, so didn't strike you as weird that your expert claimed to have sun powers uh, that, uh, you know, allowed him to read through the uh, use X-ray vision to read through the ballots. And she would say, well, you know, and then the next time the next affidavit would be Ms. Hallard, did you review this affidavit? She'd say, no, absolutely not. And Judge Parker would be like, well, did anybody review the affidavits before you stuck them in your stupid filings? <laughs> yeah. And it was so it was just beautiful in every way. Anyway, um, she was part of the, uh, you know, same fundamentals of, of pleading practice, the same hacking elections. Um, she took a three and a half hour course on the Supreme Court in review uh, in which they spent a lot of time analyzing the, the Supreme Court's uh, 6-3 decision in Brnovich that uh, upheld Arizona's voter suppression laws. Uh, eh, that seems, I don't know. Um, mm. eh, Scott Hagerstrom and Howard Kleinhandler took the same fundamentals and hacking elections classes. Uh, Stephanie Lynn Juntilla, you might remember her. She was the one who uh, handled the appeal and uh, and tried to to come in and say to, to Judge Parker, I was only here for the appeal, so you should let me out. And Judge Parker was like, did you review the affidavit? Yeah, <laughs> it, was, yeah. it, was, it was really beautiful. It was like appealing from nonsense is still nonsense, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie Gentilla could not figure out how to file her affidavit, so she filed it twice. Nice. Um, I like that. But, you know, took took real classes. Then you got into the... Well, maybe she took three hours of classes and thought that filing it twice would equal six hours. <laughs> you know, that could happen. Yeah. Uh, then you got into the those who did not give a shit, right? Uh, Greg Roll, for example, um, he was in the background for most of the hearing, but he is, as, as are all of these, right? Like we call Emily Newman, it's my first day, because that's the defense that she gave up. But she's been in six or seven of these election cases, right? Each and every one of these people are true believing right wing grifters. Uh, and you should have no sincerity. You should have no sympathy for them whatsoever. Greg Roll did not even try to follow the instructions, right? Um, he took uh, one and a half hours on the Voting Rights Act of 1965. OK, that's that was the same as Emily. Uh, he took the same fundamentals of pleading practice in state and federal court. That's the same as Emily and Julia. Uh, he took two hours of classes on voting rights in the U.S. from inception to the present. And then, I, I don't know, like a like a senior at the University <laughs> of Florida that's like, hey, man, I could hang out at the beach, you know, my last semester, padded out the remaining seven and a half hours with just electives. Right. So he took counsel's role in adopting, implementing and enforcing a code of ethics. Now, look. I agree that Greg Roll needs to beef up on his ethics, but that was not a requirement. That would just not fit under either of those standards. He also took the seemingly duplicative counsel's role in developing and adopting a code of ethics. I don't know, maybe at an attack of conscience. Mm -hmm. um, he, he took professionalism in challenging practice areas. Mm -hmm. Again, good idea. Uh, you should beef up on that, uh, but uh, not, not when you were instructed. He took... How to ethically introduce yourself to reporters and speak about your practice cases and other matters. He took ethical considerations in conducting investigations. And then, oh, my God, what I wouldn't give to have observed him to have had, you know, the uh, his his little laptop camera on and broadcasting this to the world while he sat in attorney professionalism and social justice why we should all be engaged. Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. So now we get down to the to the crack in herself. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the maestro, Sidney Powell. Hey, um, did you know that her email address is Sherlock1776 at ProtonMail.com? No. <laughs> but Isn't it, it, everyone feel free to, to send her a message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't break the law. Uh, but uh, no, it shows up on her affidavit. She decided not to, you know. Black it on it. Uh, yeah, who knows? Well, whatever. Um, Sidney Powell took the kind of tactic that uh, you might try in college when you didn't do the work, but you've forgotten that it's a group assignment mm -hmm. and everybody else in the group did the work, right? So 
uh, first she begins with a, a page of puffery about what a great lawyer she is. I have practiced law for 43 years in the highest tradition of the bar. You know what you know? this <laughs> reminds me of? I remember oh. back in high school, we had to do like a 15 page report on the red badge of courage. And one of my friends, <laughs> instead of turning in a 15 page report, he just put on the front, he put my report on the red badge of courage and he, he just open it up and it just is one page in one sentence. It says, this is courage. And then he just handed it in to see what would happen. Right. <laughs> and, I, and what? Happened? Oh, he failed. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, nice try. Actually, no, that was stupid. It's not I, even a funny I, joke. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, no. So a page of sort of padding this out. Uh, and then we get paragraph four, which says, it was difficult to find courses that might comply with this court's order on election law. Really? Yeah. 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 You and Howard wrote the appeal to the Sixth Circuit. Why didn't you just call up Howard and ask him what courses he took? Like, did you did you not? You, you share the same lawyer. You could have you could have talked to Donald. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, no. Remember Donald Campbell, the uh, yeah. election lawyer? Yeah. yeah. He's still uh, on the case. So, you know, it. it um, I guess she thought nobody else was going to do the work either and so she felt uh safe in saying ironically it seems that all the available election law courses occurred before the 2020 presidential election to augment the dearth of cle courses that deal with election issues i also watched the following videos on youtube okay. Okay. it says i also reviewed the following materials but yeah <laughs> um it will not surprise you to learn that these uh, YouTube videos are um, not the kind of thing that Judge Parker <laughs> wants Sidney Powell to be doing. So the very first video is called Fraction Magic Detailed Vote Rigging Demonstration. OK, I watched part of this video and <laughs> <Sorry>. it is <laughs> you no know, I watch I watch parts of lots of these and and, and interesting stuff happens. So um Fraction magic, as far as I can tell, is a left wing conspiracy theory about diebold machines from the 2004 presidential election. And the idea mm -hmm. is that if you set a cap in the internal software, then it will convert votes to fractional votes and then not display the fractional votes because, you know, fractions of people can't vote. You might notice that that begins with the premise if you set a cap in the election software, why or how you would do that I, 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 is not stated at anywhere <laughs> in this video. And, and look like this is an important lesson to us. Part of the Kraken Lawyers playbook right now is taking some of the more extreme claims of voter fraud from the 2000 and 2004 elections and throwing it back in our faces and saying, see, like lots of people who aren't just insurrectionist monsters like us thought that there was voting fraud. So um, that that also explains uh, this uh, documentary called Hacking Democracy, uh, which was then featured in an HBO special. And all of these are five to ten years old, right, called Kill Chain, the Cyber War on America's Elections. It's got and a that cool name, through. Kill Chain. Yeah, uh, she spells it three different ways in the uh, in the plea because, you know, Sidney Powell practicing law for 43 years, but, you know, not 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 spelling. But yeah, Kill Chain definitely sounds like a battle bots, right? Like it's, you know, robot <laughs> fighting bots. type. I love battle bots. It's it's delightful violence that harms no one. Um, and then the last one is uh, J. Alex Haldeman lecture this is this is a ted talk okay um she misspells uh haldeman uh she spells it as hadlerman uh but um it, it it's a lecture on securing digital democracies and um this was i, I wound up watching a, a lot of this um not just because it was super interesting uh it because it, it, it kind of was um but because the video only has 1,153 views on YouTube, right? This is not a mainstream thing. And yet it has two comments. And one of the comments says, Tor sent me, right? T-O-R-E, which refers to Terpsichore Maris, Tor says, 
one of the like behind the scenes QAnon true believer nut jobs. So, so the loons are sending people to this video. I cannot figure out why. You click on the video, and this video is critical of our nation's infrastructure during the 2016 election, right? It, it says, I have reviewed the active intelligence reports. We know uh, that Russia was actively trying to hack our elections. Uh, we know that they had access uh, to uh, voter qualification systems, and we know that they intervened on behalf of Donald Trump. I have no idea why Trumpers would want to would want you to watch this video. Maybe because it shows that our elections are vulnerable to something, <laughs> aka Russians. I uh, maybe, but uh, it, the the claims that have been made in Kraken lawsuits, right, are are a hundred percent unrelated, right? Like if, if, if you were to advance the claim that our election infrastructure is vulnerable to sophisticated national hacking, um, that's, that's a true claim, right? Like we have multiple overlapping intelligence agencies that, that converge and agree on that. Um, but that, that has nothing to do with like dominion voting machines, taking Mike Lindell's vote and sending it overseas to, and then to come back to Venezuela to be converted into Biden votes. And well, I, I've long said that, you know, when we were emerging from 2020 and, and all of us on the left were like, that was the secure, totally fine, wonderful election. There was no problems with it. I was like, we should probably be careful that we don't box ourselves into, you know, like the Tara Reid trust all women hashtag um, mm -hmm. in, in that we do have some problems with our infrastructure <laughs> as far as elections go, where where somebody can just grab a bunch of polling data and give it to the fucking Kremlin. Uh, so yeah. yes. maybe that's it. Maybe that's where they point to Democrats who say elections are amazing. You know, and that's not what you said in 2016. That's the only thing I can think of. But yeah, who I, knows? It, all, all I can say is if, if, if you care about free and fair elections, um, we still have a real problem in this country. One that J. Alex Alderman points out, right, that we have massive security vulnerabilities. And because we have a political party that is complicit at best and cheerleading at worst uh, of Vladimir Putin, um, we've done nothing substantively to address those vulnerabilities. It's well. real bad. Other than, you know, the ruble being worth less than a penny now. He doesn't have the money <laughs> to probably do this again. I was thinking about, like, what's going on at the Internet Research Agency troll farm today? Is everyone just sort of walking out? Uh, the, the, the checks aren't going to clear the bank. Like, <laughs> uh, it's just going to be interesting <laughs> to see. It'll, it'll be like uh, being in Silicon Valley at the end of the first dot-com bubble, right? Like, uh, <laughs> people are stealing the ping-pong tables and turning over the video, uh, the, uh, the snack machine. And, yeah. yeah, I'm sure they have all those oh. amenities there at the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. Um, <laughs> anyway, we do have some interesting comings and goings today. Oh, just one question for you, though, before we get mm. off of this topic, Andrew. What can happen to her for flouting this order? Can she be held in contempt? Uh, she could be. Uh, as certainly, Judge Parker could review. I mean, the reason that you had to file this as an affidavit, uh, describe with particularity the classes that you were taking and the length and uh, who may, is uh, certainly Judge Parker could say you did not comply with my order and uh, I'm going to issue additional sanctions that require you to comply with the order. I would love to do that. She will probably if I had to if I had my if I have to pick one. Right. My guess is that she'll let it slide. Or um, give her but, another couple of weeks to and assign her yeah, some yeah. classes or something like you have to take these. Yeah. Take these. Why not? Why, why not take the classes your fellow lawyers took? Right. Like, well, they're not available. I think, <laughs> I think you could benefit from pleading she, standards in federal court, Sydney. She uh, couldn't but, spell uh, the uh, you know Iqbal uh, when she was doing Google, <laughs> so it didn't come up for her. I C K. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, yeah. <laughs> ich bin va Is it German? Uh, it, uh, I think that would be fun. All right. We do have some comings and goings. Uh, interesting comings and goings. Uh, but we have to take another quick break. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. 
I'm Francis Callier. And I'm Angela V. Shelton. And we're Frangela. You know what you need in your life? Hmm. The Final Word Podcast. Yes, you do. That's right. It is the final word on all things political and pop cultural. Where we make real news real funny. Where we inspire you so you can hashtag resist. Subscribe and get a new episode of The Final Word Podcast each week. It's the news we think you need to hear. That's right. We think you need to hear it. Okay? Yeah, it's what we say so. That's right. And because all we do is give, every Thursday you can listen to our hysterical podcast, Idiot of the Week. We round up the stupid because you know what? Somebody has to. Okay. All we do is give. Oh, welcome back. In comings and goings today, something that pissed me off. Uh We begin with the Manhattan District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, who's been there for a minute And he's asked his investigations chief now to oversee the ongoing probe into the former guy and his business practices one day after the abrupt resignations of two veteran attorneys who had been leading this case. Yeah, absolutely. That is is right. Her name is Susan Hoffinger. Uh, She is an experienced litigator, right? She is a a recent addition to Bragg's executive team. Um, She will now take over. Uh, what has been described as a team of, of about 25 lawyers, paralegals, analysts. We know they were working uh, closely with uh, Tish James's office. Over more than three years, that group has gone through millions of records relating to the operations at the Trump org. Um, Hoffinger has significant legal experience on both sides of criminal law. She was a prosecutor uh, in Manhattan uh, from for almost a decade, right under longtime DA Robert Morgenthau. Uh, she then uh, left her family's law firm after many years doing uh, defense work, you know, so been on both sides of the uh, of the aisle. Uh, perfectly normal career path uh, to go uh, work for Bragg um, in private practice, as often happens in these cases. You know, former prosecutors will then come out uh, and handle white collar criminal defense. So. Yeah. And 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 recently that group of 25 lawyers and analysts and paralegals at the DA's office um, that she now heads recently, they've been focusing on whether assets were illegally overvalued. Right. To secure right. better terms on loans. We went over the New York attorney general filing uh, Tish James is filing on this. And that's what they were looking at over in Manhattan, whether, you know, that he was trying to, uh, you know, fluff up his assets to get better terms <laughs> on loans and insurance, but undervaluing them to get tax breaks. Right. Now, the appointment, or, or just giving the correct value, because <laughs> they're all undervalued, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. The appointment uh, on, on uh, Hoffinger follows the news that the two top prosecutors, Vance Hired, who I had all my faith and, and all of my beans on uh, to run that probe, Dunn and Pomerantz, right? Um, yeah. They resigned, apparently, over the fact that Bragg was unwilling to prosecute Trump himself, uh, a spokesperson for the office said that wasn't true and that the investigation is still ongoing, but they just peaced out. Yeah. Yeah. And that was an unambiguously terrible sign. Right. So two people familiar with the matter told The Washington Post that uh, Cy Vance had authorized those prosecutors, Don and Pomerantz, to seek an indictment against Trump. Uh, but that didn't happen before he left office at the end of the year. I would really, really like to know why. Right. Like that was. The way everything was converging, Vance had said, I'm going to wrap it up and then step down. And then uh, we watched that and he delayed uh, his departure. And then uh, soon after Bragg taking over was when uh, Dunn and Pomerantz uh, resigned. Um, Dunn and Pomerantz, I, I, we are led to believe from the story uh, in The Washington Post, apparently believed that Bragg would uh, similarly seek an indictment. But um, the source says that their new boss was slow to read their memos or meet with them. And they grew increasingly frustrated, concluding that they were losing the momentum that had been initiated under Vance. That seems really plausible to me. Yeah. Uh, and I, for one, would like to hear from Don and Pomerantz on this. They haven't uh-huh. said anything. <laughs> been very quiet, at least as far as we can hear from them, you know, but, yeah. but because of policy and whatnot. Uh, if I were pissed, I'd be, well, where's your tell-all book? You know, that's the one I want to read. Uh, Bragg was there for two months, right? Those guys were there for two years working on this case. Yeah. They know all the ins and outs. Pomerantz was running the grand jury. Uh, and I want to know what they were so upset about, enough, enough, upset enough to resign over. And, and yeah. inter- for, for something they've been working on for two years plus. And interesting trivia, though, about the new prosecutor. With her sister, Fran Hoffinger, 
She defended Vilma Bautista, who was an aide to former Philippine First Lady Imelda Marcos in a case that was prosecuted by the DA's office where she now works. <laughs> that, that is a, a great, and now you know the rest of the story, The uh, when Imelda Marcos uh, broke uh, uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, that the story was, you know, her closets and closets full of shoes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, I share that, that view with you, right. That um, the only, uh, we both covered it separately on our shows. Um, to me, the only right read from, from Dunn and Pomerantz is that uh, Bragg told them uh, I'm going to decline to, to prosecute. Yeah. It has to uh, be Donald Trump. It, it has to be. And now, and based you know, on Bragg being there is a trying minute. to walk that back. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and slow rolling the memos and not meeting with them. Right. Yeah. Like we you didn't even listen to us. We've been here for two fucking years, bro. That's has to be what happened. Right. Has to be. Yep. I don't know. And then somebody near Bragg reminded him, like, uh, uh, y- you do know that this is a political position. Yeah. <laughs> and, you're trying. Uh, you're not being apolitical here, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, maybe uh, the rest of your career is not going to go great if you're perceived as a Trump toady. Um, that's that the there are places where that will help you out, but um, Manhattan is not one not of them. Not one of them. <laughs> so, so I'm with you. I think I still think we're going to get a uh, a declination decision. But this is that look. If you're going to back off, um, this is this is at least uh, positive news. Bringing in uh, an experienced prosecutor and saying we're you know we're, we're We're not necessarily uh, closing the file. Um, Yeah. And if you do decline, I want to know why. You better fucking explain yourself that I think the public interest is is enough to to require that. Anyway. 100% agree. You want to you want to take the last one? Oh, yeah. Uh, Well, uh, let's see. Finally, uh, today, President Joe Biden announced his intent to nominate the following individuals to serve as key leaders in his administration. We got Jay Shamba. I love that last name. Nominee for mm-hmm. Undersecretary of International Affairs, Department of the Treasury. William Duncan, nominee for Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of El Salvador. Leslie Vigieri, nominee for Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Kyrgyz Republic. Did I say that right? I think so. I think so. Okay. And uh, 13 more civil servants to take key regional leadership roles at the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA. That was, by the way, the... The firm that was emptied out by Mulvaney with his fun trick to move the offices Mm -hmm. out of the beltway. And I might know something about having your job moved across the country and the government to get rid of you. (laughs) Maybe. Um, And uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the Department of Homeland Security. So a bunch bunch of stuff yep welcome aboard yep. Everybody. especially those those regional as you as you point out those uh usda uh regional leaders that that was just a a barren wasteland we have a dozen of these uh individuals being nominated every week we want to keep tabs on it because as as it uh, as we talk about in our underlying story right there is a ton of work to rebuild and uh, the biden administration has not slowed down yeah uh at all and dhs is going to is really important especially now with what i assume are going to either be ramped up russian cyber attacks or maybe the sanctions will shut them down i don't know but either way we're going to need <laughs> we're going to need them in there so yeah uh, good point we'll see what we'll see how that how that pans out but uh, you know and i've said everyone keep keep your head on a swivel anchorman style when you're on the internet, <laughs> because there's going to be a lot of disinformation, a lot uh, coming at us. Here, here, couldn't couldn't agree more. Yeah. So watch out for JD bunch of numbers with zero followers who had an account created six minutes ago. Just block and move on. <laughs> mm. Or, or, or we'll do what I do, and I say, hey, the Kremlin, the Kremlin checks are going to bounce, man. Just go home. <laughs> it's always fun. Love it. All Love right. it. That's our show, Andrew. It's been lovely seeing you on my vacation here. Um, Thanks for inviting me in. Yes, and thank you for coming up from my basement dungeon of lawyers. Uh, Everybody gets a vacation, (laughs) even me. (laughs) (laughs) You get extra fish heads and whiskey in your bowl tonight. Oh, can't wait. Uh, Jameson 20 for you today. Woo! Uh, All right, that's it. I don't have anything else. I've just been Allison Gill, AG. Uh, Do you have any final thoughts here? Nope, I'm uh, I'm Andrew Torres, and this is a cleanup on aisle 45. 
Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joel Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. They might be giants have been on the road for too long. Too long. And they might be giants aren't even sorry. Not even sorry. And audiences like the shows too much. Too much. And now they might be giants are playing their breakthrough album Flood. All of it. And they still have time for other songs. They're fooling around. Who can stop They Might Be Giants and their liberal rock agenda? Who? No one. Decide to pay for with somebody else's money.